in um, this video, in the last hopefully in this series on doing surface model modeling in urban environments, I will look at how water flows over the surface, so how to model the flow itself. So in the previous videos, we have been looking at filling and setting our DTM and DSM together and all of these different approaches. Now we are coming to the final step where we look at how water will flow. Um, there are um, some things to consider here. There are some uh, flow tools that need that you calculate the flow direction first. So there, is, there are lots of different tools that we can use for doing different calculations on terrain. So um, if we look in QGIS, there is a collection of tools under uh, terrain analysis where we can do aspect. So that is which way the water flows. We can do a relief. We can do a slope. So calculate the angle of the flow. So how steep it is. Or you can use that to find flat roofs or whatever. You know, find areas that, that are not that are flat enough for using urban gardening and whatever. So there's a lots of different tools you can use here. Um, the tool that I'll be using uh, is Ardot Watershed, and that um, doesn't need you to calculate the flow direction first. Um, so it's one of these where it's calculated as part of the procedure. Then there's the thing about how water, they, the different models. So um, we can have those that stop at depressions, um, and we can have those that run at least assistance. What other watershed can do sort of both things. It's a relatively complex um, software piece of, uh, of, of tool, but um, let's, um, let's look at it and see some of the parameters it has and how we can use it. So I will, it does a, a least resistance. Um, so it me that means that water can flow uphill. So we will see that You'll have water flowing up and over from these, from inside these blocks. Um, but that's okay. I could have made holes. So you'll typically, if you know where there will be some uh, entrance through the building, you can create a little channel there manually. That's not so difficult. But in this case, I'll just, I don't know where the connection from the inside to the outside is. So I'll um, let the water find the lowest place on the roof and just jump over. Um, that's um, one of those small um, some approximations you'll have to make. Um, so, R dot watershed. So R dot watershed. So it will take in a surface, and I'll use this my urban surface, which is a combination of DTM and DSM. Uh, then I can give it um, depressions. So I could go in and give it a layer, as for instance, my blue spot, um, where I said if it, if it comes to a layer where this is zero or not zero or not null, then the water will stop at that place. So I could filter my blue spot using my fuel calculator. Say if my blue spot is more than let's say half a meter, then it should stop at that. So I could use a layer like um, blue spot to stop my flow at depressions if I wanted to do that. But I'll just let it flow without any of those problems. The amount of overland flow per cell, this is a um, one of these where we talked about that the water can be restrained by vegetation. So we can say, oh, that can seep into the subsurface. So if this one is a percentage uh, of uh, how much water will flow through. So we can, if we have a 100, all of the water will flow, zero, no water will flow, we can stop it. So if we have a sewer, we could set that there, or we could have a sewer up here that do the same, stop the flow, or we can also we train some of the water if we know something about how permeable um, the, the surface is. So to which degree water can seep 
from the surface into subsurfaces. These are for the Usle, so this is this um, um, soil erosion model. Um, we are not going to use this for soil, but if you're going to do soil erosion, we will be using these parameters. Then we have a minimum size of external watershed. That's a bit strange one, but basically it says, so how many cells do you need to start a stream? So, um, and uh, in this case, each cell is 40 by 40 centimeters, so 0 0.6, 0 0.16 meters. So if I say that I'll use a thousand cells, so that will be 160 square meters. So big flat, uh, but not really big area. So that will be my minimum area from there. This will be my smallest unit of management. I could make this smaller. Just take longer time and be a bit more difficult to read. Um, so this is the smallest unit I can look at afterwards and see how can I manage this. I won't set this one again. It's for this soil erosion model. Um, I can do different ways of um, of having my water spread. So we talked about down here. I can set if I'm going to use a single flow direction. Talked about this in the first video where I talked about the principles of this. So this is where the steepest slope takes all. Or I can use a multi flow. This one talked about the chance of the water converging again. So uh, it's a way that if you have parallel streams, they will merge together into one. So if I, if I set it to 10, it will be the same as doing a winner takes it all. So it's basically ha half of that. Um, I'll leave it with a multi flow, but I have this conversion on it. Um, it has one thing you should be aware of, and that is uh, down here where it says, um, um, is the one I was looking for? Yeah, use positive flow even for likely underestimation. So, this by default, the software will use negative values if part of the flow is outside the map. So, if you can't say that this is the real number. So basically, if, the, if you're going to do this, you will make sure that your map, your data set was larger than the area that you're interested in. And then you could use this to ensure that, filter out those that are negative. So I'll just leave them because I have quite a lot of, this is more of the water flowing in and out of my map, in this little case here. So I'll say, okay, I will include them as positive. And that's basically the parameters I need to set for this tool. And it generates a lot of output layers. Um, some of them are of less interest um, to us. I would say one of the good things about um, grass is that, at least compared to um, um, Saga, it is really well documented. Um, I could um, have here we can see if you, you can just Google. Uh, the tools. So this is the documentation of watershed description of. So I just googled R dot watershed, and uh, description of all the parameters. Um, some notes about how they can be used. A little bit of example. More discussion. If it, this basin threshold I've just been talking about, and some code examples of use and then references. So basically. Um, while Sega can be a nice little tool, it's not very well documented. Um, while Grass is really a um, well documented piece of software, so when I can, I prefer to use the Grass uh, tools. So, um, and these here, I there's some things I don't, and we can run it all and then we can see afterwards. So, I'll just run the tool. And it won't take that long. So now um, the tool is finished. 
and I can see the results. So here we have a big, large flow line, but let's take the layers. But so this layer here is how much water flows into a cell. So this is what is called the flow accumulation. So we can see this is where the water flows out at the end of the day. Um, this one we can return to in a moment. Um, these are some of these indices about flow strength and so on. They are a bit more specialized. Um, I'll just leave them out. Um, so this is a topographical index. Again, a one interesting, especially for soil erosion. Here we have a um, watersheds. So these are our the, uh, um, each watershed. So you might uh, recognize. Let's see, can I get rid of uh, things like this? Ah, uh, that one. So here we can see inside the building. So um, this little yard consists of the water will flow. You can see where the water flows. Um, oh, that was that one. Uh, use uh, stream segments here. And that one. So here we can see how water, water flows in here. This is where it decides to go over the roof uh, and run along here. Um, so there are basically inside this yard, there are three areas that are large enough. There was this thousand cells I set. So uh, I have these uh, three water sheds. Yeah. So this is how water flows together. Um, there's a lot of water coming from here, water coming from here, or here and here, and then it flows out and flows down here. These are uniquely numbered um, watersheds. So these are, let's say, our manageable units. And we say, okay, I can do something about this area because all of the water in this area flows has a common flow. I can uh, drag this one on top. Uh, and of course, they have the same color. Uh, that's a, it's in, in some degree smart, um, but not for our, for what I was using it for. So here we can we here we see the elements, and here we see how the water runs together in streams. Um, we also had this uh, flow accumulation layer at the top, which um, is a bit difficult to read because it uh, it. Um, it just has a lot of blackness in it, and then some very high numbers. Um, this one can, this one says, and this is what you will be using as a natural air. It's not so important in our case, but basically, it gives us a number of how much water flows into a given cell. So at this point, if I make sure that is my active layer. I can say here that this is the number of cells flowing into that location. Um, again, it might be um, useful, but when I'm doing this trick of having, I'm having water running over uh, the roof, so I'm not quite sure if it is um, the absolute value is interesting for me. What is interesting for me is the patterns here. So looking at how does water flow locally. So how water flows along this street here, how it flows inside um, the individual yards. So this is the type of structure I'll be using if I was going to plan some form of retainance of water uh, within the builder structures. So I'm not so interested in this one. Because this one also, because of this water flowing over a hill and things like that, uh, it it is a very exaggerated number. But it um, it is this segment here. I can use it to see which way water flows if I can't see it from the, the structure. But here we can obviously see how 
uh, in this yard here we have water flowing together from these corners coming out here and this matches together with my uh, my um, watersheds here so these are my smallest management units this was if these are too small I could have used a larger number than those thousands or I could say 5,000 to give me larger more um, perhaps easier to manage units it depends on the scale that you're working on so but it is lots of but the main things that we are interested in is these um, label of our water basins and our flow segments that's what can give us some idea of how water flows within our build up area and how we can consider doing water management if i have been using filled um, sinks and doing uh, retention of water depending on vegetation and things like that then i might be using um, this flow accumulation layer um, but as it is with this relatively uh, coarse approach what really is interesting for me is the flow lines and the watersheds um, there's one strange layer here which is the flow direction it says which way water flows uh, within each cell but again there this is just the one to eight and i'm using um, the multi-flow direction so that again doesn't matter so it's these two layers our flow segment stream segments and our um drainage land uplands that is um that are the interesting ones and of course i can um, superimpose this on uh, my map if i want to have that instead so here we can see the flow lines on top of our map and uh, this is a raster data set so um, if you want to uh, to use it for for visualization you'll probably want to convert that back to a um, a vector so again there you can go up and do under your raster that is a conversion that goes from uh, raster to vector but this one it does polygons there is a um, there is a uh, a uh, So if you do want to convert these stream segments from raster to vector, you will see in the manual it says that what you have to do is that you'll have to uh, leave it. Uh, we have to run a fin. Um, yeah, so the streams can be output easily to vectors after running a fin. So that's basically because they are not necessarily only one um, cell wide. So First of all, we need to fin them down to one cell. So we run the R dot fin, and then we can run a R to vector. So, if I say first R fin, I take my stream network set. This is probably far too much, but doesn't really matter. I run this. So now I have a new layer called fin, which is uh, the lines that have been finned down. So they are, it's only these strange places where lots of lines meet, that's a problem. And then I can run this uh, R to vector. I run it on R, what my fin layer, and what I want is lines. I want to export the value. Um, I want to have the output as a line and probably can choose that automatically. And I think that is that. So we now have a uh, vector layer. So uh, this is my streams. Uh, 
so as vectors where I can uh, do different visualizations. I can change the width of them and make them blue and what fit and all those things that I now can do with vector layers. So um, and I could do the same with uh, my um, my uplands. So uh, my unique labels for each water catchment here. So these um, they don't have to go through um, the raster. Uh, grass don't, don't have to be filled first so here I can just go and use the built-in uh, conversion polonize so it's a raster to vector uh, in um, in QGIS so that could give me if I wanted these as vector layers also so I hope that um, we got through the whole of the process of working with how water flows in the urban environment, which special problems to look at, um, how to uh, all of these conversions and discussing which type of surface we'll be running on. And um, that although we um, have to be careful with doing the fill, um, this, um, this water out of watershed has this advantage of making this least resistant so water can go uphill, as we can see here, it goes over the, um, the buildings. But that ensures that we do have a continuous flow um, of the least resistance. And um, even though that means that we should not put too much emphasis on our flow accumulation, because the flow accumulation will be much too large, it is really good for giving us these ideas of how water flows and where to set in with different forms of management to um, control the natural flow. So, I hope that was uh, useful. Um, hope to see you in another video. Bye.